Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Welcome to A Church in a World, where we strive to the best of our ability to coach everyone up about who God says he is from his word and not what we would like him to be. But before we get started, too much also let me say welcome to those of you watching us in Liberia and also Pakistan and obviously here in the United States as well and other parts of the world. But before we get started, some information, or actually, let's get started, that's a better way of saying it, with some information on pearls. I'll see you on the other side. Few places on Earth remain as untouched as Australia's Northwest. This coastline is one of the last pristine places remaining on our planet. Between Broome and Darwin, the coast is as wild today as it was when Europeans settled the continent over 200 years ago. Thousands of miles of uninhabited wilderness where the ocean teems with life. Some we know, and others whose secrets are hidden in the deep. Like this creature, Australia's South Sea Pearl Oyster, also known as the Silver-Lipped Oyster. Although it's not much to look at on the outside, on the inside, it has the ability to produce one of the most valuable gems known to mankind. Any mollusk that produces a shell can produce a pearl. That includes abalone, marine snails, clams, mussels, and oysters. The South Sea pearl oyster that lives here produces the cream of the crop. It's a solitary creature that can grow to around one foot, living for up to 40 years. As a result, the pearls it creates are the largest, most lustrous of all. In recent years, a single Australian South Sea pearl was sold for over $1.5 million. The notion that a pearl always forms when a grain of sand enters the creature is a myth. Another possibility is that some tiny organism invades the creature and disrupts the cells in the mantle. Then, something miraculous happens. The oyster begins to secrete a smooth crystalline substance known as nacre. Nacre, or mother of pearl, is made of the same material that forms the inside of the shell. This combination of calcium carbonate and protein is both lighter and stronger than concrete. It takes several years for thousands of layers of nacre to build up and create a smooth, iridescent gem. But it's a rare event. A pearl of value is found in less than one in 10,000 wild pearl oysters. Well, as you, well, as you can see, making a pearl is a process it is a long process and one of let me give information well, not information the information that was given was to try to get you to understand why natural pearls not culture pearls okay culture pearls are the ones that we make uh, man-made natural pearls that are made as you saw in Australia are so valuable are so valuable I don't remember if they mentioned this in that article not article that video is that after many many years of diving for pearls divers have made natural pearl, pearls so rare 
Some say they are close to being extinct. And that's why they are so valuable. And we want to talk about today the value of God's word and how the verse of the day that we're studying as we, again, those of you who are new, we are walking with Jesus as he walks through the Bible, following him chronologically. And we're at Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. But to give context for this verse, we need to go back to last week. So we're going to go to Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5, which is the sermon I did for last week. But let's go there. Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Judge not that you may not be judged, for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged, and with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Verse 4, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Last week we went over these verses in the sermon called The Miseducation of Judging, where we showed from scripture how Christians are to judge. We talked about how it is so prevalent or common in society that everyone says, you're not to judge, you're not to judge me from these verses. But we showed back then that that's not what God is saying. One, of part, one part of how we are to do this properly, that in any situation, we need to come to that situation with a humble heart. Understanding that our righteousness, the only way, only reason we are righteous before God is because we are clothed in Christ's righteousness. It is because Christ is righteous, we are judged before God to be righteous. It is nothing of ourselves. We also need, when we're coming to a person where they're having a challenge in a particular area, it is really incumbent upon us to come alongside them and not be, and not for them to see from our actions, our behavior, from our words, that we are coming on high, like we're sitting as a tri tribunal, a judge and jury. And a way to do that is that when we come to them, we acknowledge the log or logs that we have in our eye. We, we talk about, we're transparent about the struggles that we have. So we know, hey, I need help in these areas. And I need prayer. I need your accountability. Because I, wanna, I want to walk closer and closer to God. And I know you want that as well. And so I am mentioning this from the word of God because, again, I'm your brother or I'm your sister, and I only want the best for you. We are walking this together. And so I wanted, I really encourage you to watch last week's sermon on this, and we'll put a tag on the bottom. It's on the website, website ACIW.org, but we'll also put a tag on the bottom to make it a little easier. There is a single link that'll take you directly to our particular sermon. This is our sermon that we use when talking about judging. And so you can share that with other, others besides yourself. Okay, so that gives you kind of the context. So now let's talk about verse 6, or we're going to read verse 6 again. Again, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy, 
and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So, if you're new to a church in a world, I like to give a question or questions for interaction as we go through our sermon or message, as I like to say. So here is your first question of the day. If you're with us live, please respond in the chat. And that's the chat either on our online service or on YouTube. If you're watching this later on video on demand, please put it in the comments. So here's the question. Have you ever had a friend or family member that no matter how many times you reason with them about a topic or subject, they have their own opinion, which is verifiably incorrect or illogical, but they insist that they are correct. They are not. So do you have anyone like that? Okay. And I'm just going to add a little more, I don't say context, a little more to that. They are never open to logic or even if you have documentation proving your point nothing you do will dissuade change their minds do you know anybody like that or do you know a number of people like that it's just a yes or no answer just yes or no all right these are people you love i mean these are dear friends family members you, you truly do love them but it's exhausting <laughs> sometimes interacting with them. So I'm going to give a, an example from, from my life. Now, I wasn't in on the conversations. Actually, I just, I just remember now. There may have been a couple I was in as well once I got a little bit older. But when I was younger, once I got to an age maybe 12 or something like that, and then there were a number of them as I went through my teenage years and into adulthood, as I, I will call these topics from Uncle Pep. Topics from Uncle Pep. Now, my Uncle Pep was a great, great, great guy. He was the youngest brother of my grandmother, okay, my, my dad's mom. And they had, I'm going to say 11 children where my grandmother was the oldest, but I think it's actually 14. Uh, but I think three of the children died early. So we're going to go with 11 if I remember correctly. Now, my Uncle Pep and his brothers, so my uncles, were all boxers in South Jersey. So I think he kind of took his conversations <laughs> in the same way as he did in the boxing ring, is that he's going to come out swinging and he was going to go down fighting. He was not going to give up. So I remember my uncle, my uncle Pep and my dad would have conversations and they would last. It seemed now I was younger, but I, I know that a number of them were over an hour just on one topic. And no matter what my dad said, now you got to understand my dad. My dad has a doctorate degree in chemistry. He was one of the most voracious readers I know. Arguably, he's definitely one of the smartest people I have ever met. He's stubborn too. And so my Uncle Pep's stubborn and he's stubborn. But my dad would like lay out logically, step by step, the topic. And no matter what he said, my Uncle Pep would come back with some reason or some totally off the wall thing, which didn't make any sense, but he would be strident about that. He would not, he would not move back one iota, not one little bit. He would not budge from it. And he would just, I just remember him going, Jimmy, Jimmy, he had a real deep voice, raspy voice. And it'd be loud. And it wasn't like he was angry. It was just, that's just how he was. And so my dad, he and my dad would just go back and forth. And it was like crazy. It really was. And so I remember that. 
those so much growing up is that it it didn't matter what my dad said. It didn't it didn't matter how I, I mean he could have had the president of the United States, uh, the United Nations, everybody could go and say, no, this is what it is, Uncle Pep, and he would not budge on what he believed. Now, I know I was adult. I was an adult when this happened because I totally remember. I can still even almost feel it walking into my dad's bedroom on the, when this happened. I started noticing that the arguments when my Uncle Pep came became less. And I didn't get it right away. I didn't know what happened. But then, it, I, and I think I got really got it after this moment with my dad. So Uncle Pepe had come down and now from where he lived to where we lived was over an hour. So it wasn't just a quick jaunt and over an hour drive and there's no traffic on this. You know, that's that's an effort my Uncle Pep was making to come visit my family and again, his nephew. So he had been at the house for maybe hour, hour and a half or maybe even longer. And my dad hadn't left the, the bedroom. And I was like, that's rude. I love my dad, but I was like, that's rude. Now I'm old enough where I'm an adult, so I can go and ask the question and actually not ask the question. I was like, hey, dad, Uncle Pep's here. Why haven't you gone out to see him? And I remember this like it was yesterday. My dad said, he knows where I am. And I was like, dad. And again, he's like, dad's elder. You know, and actually, they're probably quite close in age. Actually, I didn't realize at the time because my grandmother had my dad when she was 17 and she was the eldest. So they were actually maybe not as as much the elder as I thought. Actually, my dad might have even been a little older. I'm not even sure, but they were close in age. But it's still out of respect to do that. I was like, I tried to convince my dad to go out and just say hello. And he wouldn't do it. And I'm not saying that's the right thing. I, I really don't. I think my dad could at least said hello and gone back to his bedroom. But I, I really do believe he had gotten to the point that, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. I am not. Uncle Pep is just not in a place where he's willing to receive what I have to give even though it's the truth. And there are some times you're going to meet people who are like that. And we as Christians, we have to understand we're going to have similar situations where we're going to need the guidance and wisdom of the Holy Spirit to be able to figure out, hey, these pearls of wisdom that God has, we want to give to everyone. But there are times when we need to go, hmm, or not we need to go, hopefully, through wisdom and prayer, seeking the Holy Spirit's guidance, that the Holy Spirit will give us a check and say, no. No, that's casting your pearls before swine, your pearls before pigs. These pearls are too valuable to just give to anyone. And we see, I'm, I'm going to take something from a CSB study Bible done by Tony Evans. And so I'm going to quote this. There are numerous places in the Bible in which God instructs his people to make judgment calls. Here in verse 6 is one of them where it says, Don't give what is holy to dogs or toss your pearls before pigs. These are references to those who despise spiritual things. But you can't obey this command unless you can discern who the dogs and pigs are. The difference between judgmentalism and doing what 
Jesus calls us to do here is the standard used. When you sinfully judge, you use your own standard and condemn others. When you obey Jesus' words, you use wisdom, refusing to give what is precious in God's sight to those who refuse to value spiritual things. There are many instances in the Bible that shows us this, this principle that God, that Jesus is talking about right here. So we're only going to go to two due to time. We're going to go first to Matthew chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. Matthew chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on that day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. And for those of you who don't know that reference to Sodom and Gomorrah, these were towns that God destroyed with sulfur and fire because of how wicked they were. Okay, let's go to Acts chapter 13. Verses 44 through 51. Acts chapter 13, verses 44 through 51. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Verse 46, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, basically giving you a chance. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Again, what they're saying is we have presented this to you, but you're not willing to hear it. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. So they've given, and this is one of the things you give people the opportunity. How many times? Again, wisdom, but at least once. But the Spirit of God was communicating to, to Paul and Barnabas, okay, you're done. Now you're going to turn your attention to the Gentiles. And you have to remember the Jews hated the Gentiles. The Jews saw the Gentiles as lower class, unworthy of the att- of any attention in this manner. Verse 47, For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 48, And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many were appointed to, to eternal life believed, Again, this is, I'm going to, at times, point out sovereignty. Point out sovereignty. This is a huge statement about sovereignty. It says specifically, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Showing again that God appoints who will receive eternal life with him. Very important. Verse 49. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing 
and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But what did Paul and Barnabas do? Verse, 50, verse 51, what we just saw earlier back in Matthew. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. I hope you see this. And I'm not saying it is easy to be able to discern. You cannot. But we have to remember God lives in us. And, and looking at his word, this also now gives you a template for what to do. We are to go and speak the word of God, his truth to all peoples. But there are times, okay, we got to understand this, there are times when the Holy Spirit is going to say, that's enough. Shake the dust off of your feet and move on. I have somewhere else for you to go. Verse 6 proves that Jesus did not intend for us. <laughs> or let me put it, Jesus Verse 6 proves that Jesus didn't forbid every type of judgment call that we needed to make, that we had to, we have to judge. Make a point here. Under the, the Mosaic law, dogs and swine, which are pigs, were unclean animals. And here the terms are used to depict wicked people. So in verse 6, we, we need to understand that is what that imagery is showing us. When we meet vicious people who treat divine truths with utter contempt and respond to our preaching of the claims of Christ with abuse, disdain, and even violence, we are not obligated, we don't have to continue to share the gospel with them. But I want to be clear here as well, we may get that sort of response, but the Holy Spirit may still want us to go back to those same people sometimes. Sometimes we just have to keep getting that abuse. And there is purpose there. So we, again, this is where wisdom, discernment, and prayer, 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 asking the Holy Spirit what we should do. I know this is hard. This is very this is very difficult. You cannot do this in your own strength. We cannot do any of this in our own strength. We cannot be religious. We cannot just be spiritual. A Christian truly has the spirit of God in them, guiding them, molding them, shaping them, directing them into where they should go and what they should do. I know some of you listening or watching me right now This is new to you. You do not necessarily know what to do. You want to know more. What, what does it mean? What does it take to become a Christian? So I encourage you at the end, well, not the end of the video, at the end of me speaking, what we put up on the screen is a slide and so you can pause it, pause it and take, take down the information there. It's called Two Ways to Live. And we are now having that up at, at the very end of every message or sermon that I give or that is given here at a church in the world. We encourage you to watch that video to know about what the gospel is. 
and what that two ways to live is about. We beg you, if you do not know what the gospel is, to watch that. It is the best explanation I have ever seen. I'm very excited as we go forward in this is that the Lord wants us, the Holy Spirit has the answers for everything because he's God. And in in the coming weeks, we're going to talk more and more about that. And I'm excited to share what God has for you. I pray, I pray (laughs) that you receive it, or at least you're willing to come back next week and hear about what God has to say again. For those of you who knew any scriptures I've given today, I encourage you, this is your homework, go back to those scriptures and read in context. Read the whole chapter from where that verse came from. And if you're really, really serious, read a chapter before and a chapter afterwards. This will help you to see if what if I am using those scriptures properly. So I hope you have a great rest of your week. And I hope, I pray, that you'll come see us here next week here at A Church in the World, where we like to remind ourselves and everyone else, the Christian church is a people, not a building. God bless you, and I pray you have a great week. Love you.